Welcome to the third lecture of the course Experimental Vibration Analysis. This lecture deals with sampling and time domain analysis as covered by chapter 3 of the book Noise and Vibration Analysis. In this lecture, which is divided into three videos, uh, we will talk about sampling and discrete signals in this first video. In the subsequent videos, we will discuss analog and digital filters and then some common applications of filters for noise and vibration analysis. It is common today to record time signals. And this is also the preferred way because it allows us to analyze signals in different ways. Uh, and many times this is important because each analysis we can make limits what we can see in the signal. We will see much more about that when we come to frequency domain analysis in later chapters. In this lecture, we will look at some different things. First of all, we will look at the sampling theorem and resampling of signals. Then we will talk about filtering signals. We will also talk about integration and differentiation, which is very important uh, since in vibration analysis we often have acceleration, velocity, and displacement vibrations. And then finally, in the time domain, you can also uh, assess the quality of your measurement uh, signals. But this is something we wait with, uh, with until next lecture. But uh, statistical analysis can be used to for quality assessment of a signal. Let's start with the sampling process. One of the first things that happen with a signal in a measurement system is that it is sampled. And the process of sampling involves two things. First, the signal is discretized in time. This means that after sampling, we only know the value of the signal at certain instances in time, the sampling times. The second thing is that the signal is discretized in amplitude, as in all measurements. But this fact we will wait with until we talk about measurement systems in chapter 11. For now, we assume that we can measure the signal values at the sampling instances, instances without any error. Now, the result of the sampling uh, of an analog signal, let's say we have a signal x of t, uh, is that we take the values of x of t at the instances n times delta t, where n is just a num sample number. This sampled signal we denote by x of n. Furthermore, delta t, the sampling interval, is of course the reciprocal of the sampling frequency in hertz, which we called f sub s. So in the plot here, you see the samples indicated by filled circles and the original analog signal is the blue line. To understand the effects of sampling, uh, we will look at this illustration. On the left hand side we have the time domain and on the right hand side the frequency domain. The sampling process we can describe as the analog signal x of t on the left hand side being multiplied by a pulse train with pulses of height 1 and distance of delta 2 t, producing the sample signal. This signal we call, of pulse train signal, we call S sub 1. Now in the frequency domain, uh, the multiplication by S sub 1 in the time domain, in the frequency domain this corresponds with a convolution of the Fourier transform uppercase S sub 1. Since the Fourier transform of S sub 1, as indicated here, is a also a series of pulses, but with the distance F sub S between them. This convolution leads to the fact that the spectrum of the sample signal is repeated at every multiple of the sampling frequency. So in the lower plot here, you see the repetition of the spectrum of the original signal. This obviously leads to a dilemma. The frequency, fs half, is a crucial frequency. It is called the Nyquist frequency. And obviously, uh, 
the um, original signal must have no signal content above this frequency prior to sampling. Otherwise, the, the frequency spectrum will not be the same between zero and the Nyquist frequency before and after the sampling. Furthermore, the statement that the sampling frequency must then be more than two times the bandwidth of the signal is called the sampling theorem. So this is an illustration of why it's important to fulfill the sampling theorem. And the sampling theorem states that we need to sample the, frequency, the signal more than twice the bandwidth of the signal. Now the sampling theorem can be mathematically formulated as here. If the sampling frequency exceeds twice the bandwidth of the signal x of t, the analog signal, then the analog signal x of t can be expressed as a sum n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity of the samples in, of the signal x of n times a sine x over x type of function. This is also called the resampling formula. And because this sine x over x is so often occurring in signal analysis, it even has its own name. It's called a sync function. Now this is a bit intimidating, so I will wait with the, until the next slide to describe what this is. For now, we will just note a few important things. First of all, this means that the sampled signal is equivalent to the analog signal, which means that it contains all the information of the analog signal. So from the sample signal, we can recompute any analog value x at any analog value of t. But of course, this is only true in theory, because there is infinity in the sum. So in real life, we always have a truncated, a limited amount of data in x of n, and there we will get some approximation. So that's sine x over x. Let's look at this in more detail. The sample signal x of n is illustrated here with the samples being filled circles. Then we have the sine x over x, and the expression uh, that was so intimidating essentially just means that we center this exactly where we want the new sample, marked by an asterisk here. Then the sine over x is evaluated at the same instances as where we have the samples. So the instance is marked by Tri filled triangles here. And finally, each pair of values of x of n and the sine x over x function are multiplied together, and these products are then summed together. And this sum equals the value of the, sam of the analog signal at the time t. So this formula from the previous slide isn't really that intimidating after all, is it? But what happens if the sampling frequency is not larger than twice the bandwidth of the signal? So if we don't fulfill the sampling theorem, what happens? Well, what happens is that all frequencies are mapped onto the frequency range zero to the Nyquist frequency. Let's look at an example. Say we choose sampling frequency of two kilohertz. An 11 hertz sign will then look like it is actually a 900 hertz sign. And similarly, a 1900 hertz sign will look like it is 100 hertz. And so will a 2100 hertz sign. I recommend that you try this in MATLAB. And I recommend that you use a cosine function to avoid some problems. First, create a time axis with delta t being 1 over 2000 and with a length of say 0.01 seconds. Then calculate the 900 hertz and 1100 hertz cosines uh, and plot them in the same diagram. 
you will see that all samples coincide. Finally, try the same with 100, 1900 and 2100 hertz, and you will see that they all coincide. Here is an illustration of that first example where you see also where we also have plotted a finer um, resolution with 10 kilohertz sampling in blue and then we have the 900 and 1100 hertz samples and you see that they completely coincide. This phenomenon is called aliasing and we will now see why. The phenomenon can be described or illustrated in two different ways. In the upper plot here, it is shown how the 1100 hertz sign is appearing as a 900 hertz. And the 1900 and 2100 hertz are appearing as 100 hertz signs. Illustrated this way, the phenomenon is called aliasing, since the frequencies appear as other frequencies than they actually are. In the lower plot instead, the frequency axis is folded at every multiple of the Nyquist frequency. When the frequency axis is folded like it's indicated here, you will see that the frequency axis will go from zero to Nyquist frequency and then down again and up again and down again and so on. Illustrated this way, the phenomenon is instead called folding. So both aliasing and folding are names for the same phenomenon. The aliasing phenomenon has some important consequences. First, every measurement system, for noise and vibration analysis at least, must contain an analog anti-aliasing filter prior to the A to D converter, the analog to digital converter. Secondly, we define the oversampling ratio of a sampled signal as the ratio of the sampling frequency and the bandwidth of the analog anti-aliasing filter. So the oversampling ratio is the sampling frequency divided by the bandwidth of the filter. The oversampling ratio is often equal to 2.56. This used to be a standard in measurement systems for noise and vibration analysis. Today, however, you can find some systems using a lower oversampling factor, but the factor 2.56 is still very common. Finally, in this video, we will talk briefly about resampling. The formula for the sampling theorem or interpolation that we described earlier can be used to resample a measured signal, that is, to recalculate the analog signal corresponding to a higher or lower sampling frequency than was originally used. This can be easily implemented in MATLAB by using the resample command with the syntax of resample xpq, where x is the data vector with the data in a column, uh, and p and q are integer numbers and the signal x is resampled to a new sampling frequency equal to p over q times the old one. Naturally, if the new sampling frequency is lower than the original, the signal needs to be low-pass filtered before the resampling. This is automatically taken care of by the resample command. We should now proceed to the second video for lecture 3 video 3b.